Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those whose time is late right now. It is my pleasure to declare the opening of our summer summit, Adasa International Summer Summit, an incredible opportunity to meet with Adasa Medical Organization experts through a number of events that we are going to have over the next three weeks. The Summer Summit intends to provide an incredible opportunity for all our friends, followers, currently and in the future, to get direct access to the edge of medicine, innovation, healthcare, and all the other knowledge and know-how that our incredible experts, doctors, researchers at the DASA Medical Organization in Jerusalem can share to the world. We've been doing this for the last several weeks, for the last few months, around the issue of COVID-19 and this extraordinary pandemic. But now we want to offer to the world the knowledge of Adassa, not just for what concerns understanding COVID-19, but for any other issues that are important for our health, because the center of our lives is not COVID-19, but the center of our lives is our lives themselves. And anything we can learn about any, uh, any other health issues is something that is important for us, for our families, and for our societies. My name is Jorge Diner. I am the Associate Director, currently Acting Director of ADASA International. And on behalf of ADASA International, it is my pleasure to start this Summer Summit with an incredible event that my colleague and dear Jan will introduce in this very moment. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, it is an incredible event that we have tonight, where our guest tonight is, tonight and today actually, depending on where you are, is Julie Benvenisti. And she's gonna share with us a little bit of her perspective. Uh, she, uh, she came to uh, Israel as a teenager from the US. And after high school, she attended the Hadassah Hebrew University Henrietta Sol School of Nursing, and then was drafted to the Israel Defense Forces where she served as a nurse. And she has been working at Hadassah for more than 20 years. And she is now the academic consultant and nurse educator at Hadassah. And uh, before we enter the main topic of this webinar, Julie, I'd like to ask you if you could uh, tell us a little bit of what you do at Hadassah and what was your role, what has been your role during COVID? Um, um, I'm working as an academic consultant for the nursing, uh, the nurses at Hadassah, which means if nurses want to do research or there's a quality improvement program they want, want to do. It, together with me, we worked on the project so it's the most scientific and most evidence-based it could be in any absolute, any and every uh, format that can be imaginable. So that's my job as academic consultant. I'm also working as an educator in the School of Nursing where I'm a thesis advisor for masters and PhD students that are in, in, in the School of Nursing. So those are my two half-time jobs. And, and okay, and now during COVID-19 crisis, um, of course there was no a university. So I went in as a bedside nurse. So I worked in the ICU, the Corona ICU, doing my shifts, any shift that they needed. And in addition, we did a national um, randomized control trial for severely uh, COVID-19 patients using a drug called Actimera um, compared to placebo. 
in, in patients with um, severe respiratory distress. And my job was to coordinate this randomized controlled trial throughout the country. Okay, so, and make sure that I was busy, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, okay, so during the lockdown and uh, all around the world in Israel, we saw a lot of people cheering for the medical staff from their balconies, their garden. I also did it and calling them heroes, but I'm sure that it must have been very challenging, the working condition uh, for you, for the other nurses. Um, can you tell us about the emotional and social experiences that you had, you and your colleagues? Okay, Jean is asking me this question specifically because we talked about a national research that we're starting at Adassa to investigate the um, differences or actually the social dissonance between how we were thought of in our country as heroes and working as the frontline um, soldiers, protecting and defending our country, going into working with COVID-19 patients, and the isolation and the rejection that we felt when we came home or in our neighborhood or anywhere we went, uh, people didn't want to get near us because they knew that we were working in the hospital. So although we were thought of as heroes and frontline uh, soldiers, we were actually in our intimate group as a family group and wider it, with friends and neighbors, we were absolutely um, rejected and um, people would sh go away from us and tell us not to come there and in, in, in many, many instances. So, in, and there are in even nurses who were um, asked by their families not to come home because the families thought that they would bring the, the virus home. So nurses, um, we had to find somewhere for them to sleep and be because they had no place, they had no home to go to. So, yeah. So this, 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 this dissonance um, has motivated us to make a national and probably it will go international study on uh, the feeling of um, social rejection working in a pandemic. Okay, and did this uh, um, rejection, did it affect the work of the nurses? Um, well, we knew we had to work for our patients, but usually you work on shift and then you go home and you can kind of chill out and cope and be in a very nice, warm, secure, safe place at home. But here, the people that were are, are our support, in, if there was elderly people, they didn't want the, the nurses to come home. There was also a sense of not understanding. If I'm totally wearing preventive equipment and I'm shielded with so many layers, I'm not going to be carrying Corona anywhere with me. So people were not informed really, and and they were irrational about um, having any contact with any nurses in the hospital. Not especially those that work with Corona or severely sick Corona patients. Um, we were like shunned from society. Not everybody, but uh, people who understood, you know, knew that we were protected. I didn't want to get sick, so of course I'm going to protect myself as best as I can. But uh, many people were very, very irrational in understanding uh, if we could, how corona is uh, passed between person to person or, or how someone gets sick with corona. So, um, and now that I'm reading more and more papers, I see that it's uh, everywhere in the world. It, people who were physicians as well as nurses who worked with um, corona patients or COVID-19 patients are um, had a very severe feeling of isolation more than everybody else. So we could really only be with ourselves. In fact, uh, of course, this uh, um, epidemic was, was going through over Passover. So if we worked on Erev Seder in, in the Corona unit, we made a nice Seder for all the patients who were there and we had matzah and we did all the uh, four questions and the four <laughs> glasses of wine and we did the whole Seder in our full protective gear 
in the in the in the corona unit so so our allies were each other and our patients okay can you tell us more about this study that you're doing uh, nationally okay. are you working with other hospitals also or just hadassah yeah well hadassah is initiating the study and uh, we're using the um, israeli society of critical care nurses as our platform to disseminate the study throughout Israel. And um, we're also finding out how other hospitals set up their corona units and how other hospitals protected their nurses or had places for the nurses to be, nurses and physicians to be if they couldn't go home. And uh, so we're finding more and more about what to do. And this is very important that we are sharing this information because for our, if there's going to be a second peak, at least we'll know how to prepare ourselves and prepare our staffs and, and, and assure that the next time it's going to be better for the staff. Can you give us, I'm, I'm sure the study is not over, but can you give us a little bit of the results if you already have and conclusions uh, okay, so one study, study we're doing is about the, the dissonance of the social rejection and the prevalence of what nurses felt um, could they go home did they have a safe place to go to um, and suggestions of uh, where how we want to improve this and this is we're just now preparing and doing a validation of the questionnaire and we're piloting the questionnaire so we're um about to disseminate it through uh, the platform of the national organization the national society of critical care nurses that's in israel but we know from our talking with um, nurses internationally that they also had the same thing wherever they were and more more um papers are coming out from high, 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 critical areas like the New York area and Washington State area where um, this it, it's coming out Al, um, this is this overall feeling of social rejection and social isolation is, is affecting the nurses but in other study that we're also doing it using um, coming from Adasa is the quality of care that patients are getting in COVID-19, especially the critical care patients. I'm from critical care, that's where I'm from. So this is, a, this is another story, John. So I'm going now to another uh, research that we're doing. So nurses, you, you have to work one ICU nurse to two patients. And now we were working one ICU nurse to six patients. And the other nurses that work to help us or to be our backup came from all the other areas of the hospital. And this we know, and this is how everyone in the world is working, not just us. But this we know um, had a great uh, impact on the quality of care that patients were receiving during the high, the peak times. You're talking about the quality of care of the patients. Uh, yeah. How was the quality of care of the patients in Adassa? As a nurse, can you um, tell us more about it? Yeah, okay. So in Hadassah, we were able, using the, the um, uh, round building, yeah? Round building, we all know what I mean by round building of Hadassah, it's, yeah? Yes. So just to, to explain, it's uh, one, one of the buildings of the Hadassah Hospital, which is separated from the other buildings. And it was the original, it was the really, really the original building that Hadassah built in, in the 60s. And it was emptied out and went in, and all the patients and staff went into the Davidson building. So it was really more or less empty. There was only two departments there. And it was being planned to be um, renovated. So it would be nice and um, as good quality in facility wise as the Davidson building. So we were very, very lucky that this building was available to be expanded into a total Corona building, COVID-19 building. So all those floors we could utilize and put um, COVID-19 patients in, in the round building, which was very, very good. So because the uh, infrastructure was already there. Um, we had to adjust and be flexible, but we could use it. So there were two floors, the eighth floor and the seventh floor, which we used for critical care patients. And the fourth floor and the sixth floor and other floors were used just for patients who were 
needed to be in isolation because they were COVID-19 positive and they needed uh, support by nurses and patients and nurses and physicians, but they did not need to be in critical care. So we had other floors that were manned by other uh, staff to watch those patients, to care for those patients. So we opened up two ICU units with one unit had um, six beds and the other unit had, I don't know, about 17, 18 ICU beds, okay? But we didn't have enough nurses to man all those beds because you can't just open an ICU even though you have the facilities without having the staff, the nurses, and the physicians. So we we had to spread our staff very, very, very thin. So mm -hmm. even nurses who haven't worked bedside in, I don't know, five or six years, like me, went and worked regular shifts like everybody else. So we use nurses who were retired. We use nurses who have moved on to work in education to come back to work in ICU. And we needed to take nurses from other places like ophthalmology, dermatology, the OR, which was had lowered its capacity. So we needed to use nurses from the clinics. And these nurses do not have the competencies to work with ICU patients. And now that we're entering a little bit, or we will enter a second phase, um, how will your studies uh, help with the nurses going back to to this and and to have uh, uh, a, a good uh, care for the patient? Well, if very quickly, we put a lot of pressure on the Ministry of Health that they should open postgraduate ICU courses and as fast as possible, train nurses, as many nurses as possible, to work in critical care. So um, that's what uh, that's one of the things. So we're opening critical care courses all the time, all over the country, and of course also in Hadassah. And we're giving mini courses. We're going to do mini competency courses for nurses starting next week at Hadassah to raise the competency of the nurses who work in internal medicine, nurses who work in surgery, nurses who are working at them. The nurses have to rotate from their um, usual home department that they work in into the ICU. So we're gonna to have to do quick competencies. So we're gonna have short in-house competencies as well as a national national uh, postgraduate course. Amazing, wow. And so you said you're doing this national study, international study. Uh, what does it mean international? How international is it? Um, Hadassah nurses are, I'm only talking critical care because that's my clinical area. Hadassah nurses are part of the network of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the, and the European Federation of Nurses. So we have a very, very tight group of nurses that we're in contact with daily, if not several times a day. And we learned from these nurses while COVID-19 was going on, how did they work with we call them non-organic staff. How did they work with nurses who, when I say to the nurse, uh, put the patient on IMV 16 with a PEEP of 20 and an IE ratio of one to three, they know exactly what I'm talking about. We're talking the same language. So how did they train and work with nurses at such a quick, um, quick rate? So we learned from them what they did in Sweden and in the UK, which has a huge amount of patients, in Sweden who has a huge amount of patients, how they train their staffs and how they worked. So they are all with us in this study. It's going to be with Spain and Italy and Belgium and the UK, Holland, Poland, and Sweden. So, so far with us in this project. So it's going to be thousands and thousands of nurses worldwide, European-wide. So yeah, so right now it's European. Is it going to expand to other countries? America, we have a yeah, lot of people from all over the, around the world. We'll have to have a, like a, a call for partnership and which will go through the World Federation of Critical Care Nurses and any partners who want to join. And um, so we have a tool which will measure the quality of care and it measures the quality of care that each patient gets by hour by hour in the ICU. And we're going to do the uh, relationship between 
which nurses worked. Was an ICU nurse, was a nurse from, or a non-ICU nurse. That's how we'll call them. ICU nurses compared to non-ICU nurses. And we can, we'll be able to see the morbidities and mortalities in relation to the case mis mix of the staff that worked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, when I ask an ICU doctor, would you want to work a shift with a dermatologist with these patients? They say, oh, no, of course not. So why do we think it's okay for nurses to work that aren't trained to work in the critical care? But this is happening all over the world, not just here. So just so we're a little bit less scared, how was it? Were the nurses competent? Were they doing a good job with the patients, even if they're not used to ICU? I'm sure like nurses are, you know, they, they're very resourceful, especially nurses at Hadassah. We've seen it for a hundred years. Uh, tell us how, how it was uh, for them. These patients, the COVID-19 patients are not like anything we've ever seen before. It's not like ARDS, it's not like any disease. It's something very new and very, very, very severe the severe patient. So we were, we were not confident working with these type of patients. It, the patient's um, flow of care was not the same as anything else. So everything was a mystery to us. So uh, I can only say that for the shifts that I worked, and I worked almost every day in the ICU, every day I was there six days a week, seven days a week, and I can see each time that I went in that um, we had to catch things that weren't getting done or catch things that were being missed by nurses who didn't have the competencies. They didn't even know these competencies. So I can tell you the things that I caught and the things that I did to remedy the situation, but I, it's only, only when we do a study, Jean, can we find out if it was only me I know it's not me because everyone wants to do the study that or what everyone else was um what everyone else was going through what their thoughts were their perceptions were not just at Hadassah but everywhere so yeah nurses in Hadassah are very good but if you are in a specialty that's a specialty you know so we're hoping next time if there is a next time we hope there's no going to be a next time but if we may have to bring ICU nurses from parts of the country which were not affected by COVID-19 like nurses from Naharia, nurses from Rambam hospital, nurses from other hospitals that should ICU nurses come work at ICU that's another solution we might we might have to think about I see we have uh, yeah, a Yeah, we have a chat. I read it, yeah. Um, the, uh, the question Nancy's asking is, what kind of, can I share some uh, experience, uh, stories of nurses in, in Hadassah, what we did for the families of the ICU patients? Yes, there's a policy. There's a policy by the Ministry of Health that says no visitors can come into um, the ICU How, and when these patients were so critical. And, uh, and that's the policy that we had to work with. However, the families would call and we made sure that we talked to everyone who called. And we couldn't talk to everyone because we had a very, very, um, a mask that was vacuumed onto our face and then another mask over that. So, and we couldn't hear and we couldn't speak so clearly. So we had to repeat things many, many times. So you can imagine that this was not so easy. The communication was not easy to do. And um, I'm very fortunate to work with nurses that realize after a week, that we could not abide by this policy of not letting families in when their loved one was dying. And this is the stories you hear again from everywhere in the world. For these people to die without family was is the worst thing, is the worst thing that anyone can imagine. So it was something that we could not be, we could not have 
we could not live with this. So we all, when the, I worked and we had dying patients, I, we always let one family member come in, be next to his loved one, and say prayers if he wanted to pray and be as long as he wanted to be. Now we understood from the Ministry of Health that, that our protective equipment, of course we would dress the patient, the family up in the whole equipment that we wore with all the masks and all the um, astronaut equipment that we would, this is how we put it on the families also. We wanted to protect them also, but we could not live with not letting anybody in. So we, we left, we, let uh, family members come in. Usually it was only one per um, person, per patient, but we did. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't just stand by and let these people die by themselves or just with us. We needed, they, everyone needed closure. We needed for the families to come in and have closure with their loved ones. So we let uh, family members in. Not, uh, it's not an easy situation. Uh, I just want to invite everyone, if anyone has a question for Julie, you can, uh, as you see, you can put it on the chat. Um, so I see one from Patricia. Uh, is it possible to give us basics on going out to markets uh, for food? Okay. Masks during the, and... yeah, during the, uh, I would say forced lockdown that we, no one was going anywhere. No one was leaving their houses. Um, we could order food from the supermarket online. And many, many people did that. We ordered food online and uh, because of our, um, our farmers were, have all this produce and they couldn't, if they couldn't distribute the produce, we were ordering straight from the farmers. So this was, we wanted to help them. We don't want them to go out of business. So there was on Facebook and everywhere we were ordering lots of nice produce straight from the farmers and they were delivering it to us. Or there was a central place that we could go and just get our package and come out. Um, and, that's, and that's how we did it when we had the forced lockdown. But you have to remember that in uh, anyone who works at Hadassah had a sign on their windshield that said Hadassah nurse, a doctor, Hadassah doctor at work. Uh, I had to come back. I'm at work and I'm on, on, on duty. That's what it said, the sign. So we, we were not stopped. We could go and come back, but um, we were the only people on the roads. So I could go and get my food and come back. That's, uh, that's really amazing. I can see how they work together. Uh, we have many more questions. Um, yeah. What were the results of the drug test? Uh, oh. Of the drug oh. that you spoke about okay. in the beginning. Okay, so Actimera is a drug that is a, actually the mechanism of the drug is that it's a, it's a blocker or it's a competitor to the COVID virus going into the um, COVID, the receptors, and it blocks the COVID from going into the, uh, into the lungs, and it prevents what we call the cytokatic storm. So we were giving this to patients as they were going into respiratory distress, and, and it's a drug that we only give once, IV, Okay, so uh, we we're fortunate enough, we started, we had ethics approval from Hadassah on uh, Erev Pesach and from the Ministry of Health one hour later on Erev Pesach. So at six in the evening, uh, we got all the approvals and uh, the, head of the, uh, uh, the head of this trial was uh, Professor Ruven Pizel from ICU and anesthesia and Eitan Galun. I'm sure you know him. He's mm -hmm. from genetic therapy. So he left his family on Erev Pesach and went to the Ministry of Health uh, pharmacy. And in his car, he took the drug and he started distributing the drugs to all the centers in Israel who received uh, approval. So uh, we started giving out the drug. And by the time enough centers had, had re received their final approval, we started to go de decline in the number of new cases because it only could be a new case. So we recruited all in all 20, uh, case, 20 people into this uh, COVID-19 uh, trial. However, the same trial is being done in many centers around the world, and we want to combine our data with their data to see if it, with larger numbers, we'll be able to see uh, better results. 
So, and we also took blood. Uh, we wanted to see the cytokine level of all the patients every single day that uh, they were in the uh, in the ICU. So for 30 days, we have bloods and we have gene, we can do their gene uh, uh, sequencing to see what the genetic uh, compound of these people that got sick were. So hopefully wow. it will be uh, together with the gene therapy and how they reacted to this drug called Ectomera. Amazing. Wow. Another question. Uh, I see with so much uncharted nursing responsibilities and people's very lives at stake. How did you keep up the confidence and morale of your nursing teams? And also maybe it goes together. How, how was it dealt with the spouses and children of nurses who were worried about the nurses going home? And like, how did you keep the morale of everyone? Okay. Um, so on the spectrum of how worried people were, uh, you, you have to find the right uh, medium. Like uh, my husband would say, okay, when you come back from your shift, make sure you get completely naked outside the house and run into the shower. So, I mean, I mean, I didn't, I would come home at like 12 o'clock at night. Of course, there's nobody around. And I would take everything off, all my clothes, everything, everything, everything in the vestibule of my house and run into the shower and make sure that, uh, and all my clothes would go into two trash bags and I would take a shower and then I was allowed to continue my life. But these are the conditions. So many, many families had conditions like this. Okay, you can only come home if, the, if you can stay under these conditions. And uh, some families did not let their nurses come home so the nurses went to other nurses homes or they had uh, facilities at the hospital where they could stay but we were very close the people who worked uh, with COVID-19 patients were we we were our own support group very very close with each other and what's up and uh, and uh, chatting and text all the time so we kept and we laughed about all these silly silly people that um, wouldn't let us uh, um, I know uh, one of the pipes, the sewage pipes, I live in an apartment building and one of the sewage pipes uh, burst. So I, I have one neighbor who was it hysterical because she said the sewage coming from my apartment is going to be full with the coronavirus. So <laughs> this is, uh, you know, there are so many, many people who are very rational. So yeah. And uh, not much you can so, do with irrational. You just have to find the right uh, combination or the right uh, conditions that you can uh, continue your life. So basically, laughing helped you keep morale and uh, and kept going. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of laughs about my neighbor in the sewage, or I had to do a motor vehicle inspection of my car, and of course, I have the sign on my car that says I'm a nurse at Adassa. And so they told me to roll down my window and which department do I work in? I said, I work in the ICU Corona. So they said, roll up your window really fast. And they left the building. They <laughs> left the, all the inspectors left the motor vehicle. I said, oh, my car must have the cooties. My car must be infected with COVID-19. But I must tell you, it's the secret to success because I passed that inspection like within 30 seconds, no, no problem. I like passed the inspection and I left. So. Did you, after this, did you put a mask on your car though? Just to make sure? <laughs> ah, good idea. Good idea. But I did write a paper about it and it's uh, published. Uh, Sigma Theta Tau was having a newsletter of what's going on. And when we published a paper of, uh, of different antidotes that nurses are going through and, uh, and this uh, went for publication there. Wow, amazing. And uh, almost last, last question, what was the rate of infection in the ICU for the nurses? Do you know the rate? Yeah, okay. The, the, yes, because uh, Professor Rothstein made sure it, we felt very taken care of and very cared for by the administration of the hospital that made sure that we were tested every five days. He did it for us, he did it for our families, and he also did it so we wouldn't spread um, the virus in the hospital. So we, met, we had to mandatory voluntarily every five days uh, get tested. We do have one last question. Uh, can you share a hopeful story that you experienced 
during this uh, situation at Hadassah? Uh, I can share that um, a nice majority of our patients did get better and did recover from COVID-19. So that's hopeful and it's nice and, um, and it gives us the satisfaction we have to keep on working. Um, and of course it was hopeful that we I would say it was very brave and it was hopeful that the nurses defied the national policy and let these families come in to be with their loved ones. This is, this is something hopeful. Like uh, uh, we're telling the world, if you come to a doctor, you're not gonna die alone. I mean, this, this is something that I could proud to say that we, um, it was a policy that was made by people who don't take care of patients, obviously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... I see there are a few questions about statistics. Uh, we're gonna share a, a, a website uh, in the chat for uh, those answers. And I know Jorge had um, giving him the mic now for a few minutes. He had a few comments. Um, Jorge? Yeah, yes, for, for, you first of all, I'm, yes, of course I'm here all the time. Um, <laughs> You know, I think, you know, sometimes I know in this, uh, as I see all the different uh, small screens in Zoom, you know, I see so many friends of, of ADASA, um, of HWCOA and ADASA International from all over the world being part of this event. But there are also many people who, who don't know uh, ADASA so closely. And, uh, and I think, you know, that sometimes when, when we have the challenge to present what ADASA is about, you know, we might be speaking about, you know, numbers, statistics, the, the volume of the activity we do and, 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 the, and the incredible infrastructure that we have developed for the, the health of the people of, uh, who live in Israel and to, by extent to the world. But I think, you know, one of the things that I think I'm taking from this event, and I want to thank uh, Julie for that, is that what is very essential to explain Adassa is the DNA of Adassa, and that's the spirit of people like you, Julie, and, uh, and many others like you, who go you know, above and beyond the role of a doctor and take the value that Henrietta Salt envisioned more than 100 years ago of not just bringing health because it's important, but bringing health because it's our mission, because it's part of the values that we stand, uh, we stand as Jews, as human beings, and in these times, uh, that message of compassion that you bring, you know, you chose a story of not how we help people live and how we help people say goodbye to those who die. And I think that that's symbolic of, of, of what Adasa is about and, and every individual, not, not every, but many of the individuals who work at Adasa. There's one question I want to ask before I, I make some uh, 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 closing comments from my side and then let Jan close the event. And there is one question I, I, I have to say, I have to ask you, and, and that concerns, you know, I, I see you and I remember you from the, the, the few occasions I had a chance to hear you talking and listen to your presentations and hear, hear about your work, is that you are one of the icons of Adassa in everything that we share about the role of Adassa as a bridge for peace. And, 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 and how uh, the dialogue between Jews and Arabs, Arabs is part of, uh, of our routine. You know, sometimes, you know, when people hear about this for the first time, it's, you know, it looks like an extraordinary story for people who live doing this every day. And, you know, myself, you know, being part of uh, here in Israel of what Adasa does, it's part of, of, of the lifestyle of the organization. But during these times and from your place as, uh, 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 as, as a nurse where you are in, in, in the environment of Adasa, do you think that these times strengthen that connection? Um, make us be separated because in some cases, you know, there are, there were some physical separation and different realities in one place or another. How, how, how that piece of the, of the experience that is being part of Adasa and that for you and for us is so important, um, went through these uh, extraordinary times of COVID-19. Okay, so during, uh, as it started here in the very beginning of March, we were in contact with our Palestinian um, 
colleagues and we heard pa parallel what was going on in Israel, what's going on in Palestine, and they w needed very fast guidelines and policies that we were doing here, uh, making here the nurses and physicians, and we're sending it to them. So we're writing them in Hebrew here in Israel, and then I would translate them into English. I would send it to the Palestinians, they were translated into Arabic. So the policies that we're making about um, how to get dressed and how to protect ourselves and and uh, how to ventilate the patients from 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 how to section the patients, everything that we were developing, we were translating and I would come home all night, translate everything, send it to them so they can act as quickly and protect the population in, in Palestine as quickly as possible because if they get sick, we get sick. If we get sick, they get sick. So um, we wanted to protect the whole population in the area. So we had a lot of sharing of guidelines and policies. And um, I would get a what's up uh, at like uh, quarter or 11 at night. Uh, what's your policy when someone dies? I mean, how do they bury somebody? How do you, how do you take, I mean, in, in Jews, we don't use a cough, coffin. And if you're, you have COVID and you put the person, you bury the person, I mean, it's not as if you put them in a coffin, so it's uh, different in and, and Palestinians and Muslims don't either. So um, how do you deal with that? What's, what's, how long does the COVID stay alive, the, the virus itself stay alive? So this something, and a quarter to 11 at night, we were going back and forth what the policy, what we're doing, what they should be doing. So obviously it was something that happened uh, very suddenly, and uh, they needed advice uh, how we were doing it. So. So we were online constantly sharing uh, policies and work uh, systems and all the time. So I think it's amazing. You know, it's an amazing story. And I hope that many people will listen to this story also once this story goes out or this presentation goes out on YouTube uh, in, in, in a short while as we are going to share to the world and that you will be able to share this to, to, uh, to other people you want to hear. Uh, you want to hear the story. I think that, uh, you know, you know that uh, most of the people on this uh, webinar, and for those who don't know, at Adas International, we have translated the, the protocols of, uh, of HMO uh, to English, Spanish, and Russian. And this has been already distributed to, to thousands of uh, medical professionals all over the world. And uh, we are very proud of that. And it's, it's amazing to hear that, uh, that in, in a different way this was translated right away by you coming home, you know, and translating every day, making sure that Palestinians on the other side of the line, uh, they get this, you know, on, in, in, on a timely manner so that they can save lives and, and contain the, uh, the, the, pandem the pandemic uh, in, in, in the same way we were doing in Israel. So really, th th this is incredible. I think there are a couple of things I want to mention. I don't want to uh, leave them without uh, uh, making a comment. One is that there was a mention about the round building. The round building is the historical building of Adassa and both uh, HWCOA and Adassa International have uh, been for, for a number of years working on, uh, on, on, on a campaign to renovate the building, something that we uh, hopefully and proudly will uh, be able to complete in the, next, uh, number, in, in the next couple of years. I don't want to mention any name of all the leaders that are in this meeting that were involved in this to make sure I don't forget anybody, but everybody knows uh, uh, that uh, this has been a very important uh, project that continues to be for Adassa and with no doubt during this, uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, the, the building served a very important purpose of uh, facilitating the opening of uh, units for COVID-19 patients and IC units for COVID-19 patients something that we might have to reopen as we see the, no, the, the numbers increasing, the right, the current numbers as they were coming in the last few minutes for the last 24 hours in Israel are approaching 500, almost 500 new COVID-19 positive uh, patients in Israel, which is uh, it's a big number. And uh, uh, we all hope that that doesn't mean there is a second way, but uh, the numbers are increasing by the day in the last few days. So we have to be alert. Uh, and uh, and keep playing the role uh, the role we play. We also pray for the people in Mexico. We have a lot of people in Mexico, and in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, hour, there has been a 7.5 earthquake in Mexico, affecting also Mexico City, and that's probably the reason we don't see many of our 
usual Mexican participants in this uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. So we are sharing our uh, prayers uh, with them. Every, everybody, our the people from our board have been writing that they are all okay. Um, uh, but uh, we hope uh, that uh, that that continues to be the same for them and for the people in Mexico, one of our best friends in the world. Uh, and having said that, I just want to pass the torch to Jan, who has done an amazing job today, uh, and thank her and Attila uh, from uh, ADAS International team for putting together this event and uh, the entire Summer Summit that you shouldn't miss any of the events. You should really, if you can, be in all the events. We have an incredible program, incredible program. Jan, if you could please share about tomorrow and any other information. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and uh, everybody for me here. Julie, thank you so much for uh, today. Um, and our webinar of tomorrow will be uh, with Dr. Tamar El Ram, the director of Adasa Hospital in Mount Scopus. And it will be at 6 p.m. in Israel, which is 11 a.m. Eastern time and 4 p.m. GMT. Um, and I would also like to share that we have an amazing uh, uh, challenge at this time, the Adasa Song Challenge, uh, with the song translated in English, Let Us Be Healed, uh, by the Israeli artists uh, Yair Levy and Shai Sol. And you can make your own version and adaptation of the song, and the most original videos will win the chance to sing with the artist on Zoom. And this will be recorded and shared internationally. Uh, so we're very excited about this. And we're very excited about all the events coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we have shared on the chat the link where you can see all the details for all of this. Thank you so much, everyone, for following us tonight. And thank you, Julie, again. Thank you, Jorge. And we'll see you in the next webinar.